Hi teammates, my name is Sean J. McCall and I am your host of the Eurostep where we look to get behind the scenes of basketball in Europe and see what our guests have to tell us about their experiences. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to add that you should look down into the comment section or the question mark with the, with the speech bubble around it. And if you have a question spontaneous during this, during this broadcast, then please do throw it in there in the comment section or in the other part. And then I'll see if I can get your questions on as the interview is going live. Thank you, P. I see you just jumped in. Um, yeah. So let me get started with my first, my first guest, my only guest tonight. Um, She's coming off a terrific season where she won both the Austrian League Cup and the Austrian season title, the double. Um, Pia Johar is an Austrian national team member and she knows the difference between playing in Europe and going overseas to play in college. And that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to have her on so we can talk about that. So we'll talk about her college experience, um, her professional seasons this far, thus far. And we'll also get her thoughts about maybe possibly moving to another better league here in Europe. And also what's really important to her is how basketball players should leverage their athletic skills uh, for their future careers. So we'll talk about that as well. Let me get um, Pia in here now. So she should be here any minute. There she is. Hi, thank you for having right. me. Hi, Pia, how are you doing? Good, you? Fine, fine. So, Pia, um, this is the part of, the, part of the show where I say how we kind of met each other. And, I mean, so far, I think about 80% of my guests on the show I've never met personally, which is kind of weird. But, um, yeah, I think I reached out to you first because I w I'm always looking for uh, the female point of view because I think uh, that that female basketball in Europe especially is underrepresented and um, just not talked about enough. And so I always try to get different different angles, get different views. And that's why I hit you up. You are an Austrian national team member, as I said, which is also a, a pretty cool thing. And I don't even know if you know it, Pia, but did, did you know that I'm Austrian? Um, I actually did not know that, no. Yes, I'm I'm Austrian. There's my my I have ID. one of those too. <laughs> <laughs> and I also played for the Austrian national team as well back in the day. Cool. Yeah, I did see. not know that. Fun fact. Yeah, see? Okay, so this is how we're going to uh, start the, the interview. Um, we'll talk about your athletic career, um, of course, um, everything what goes around uh, your basketball career, whether it was in the States or, or here in, in Europe, and kind of figure out what, what's behind the athletic person of Pia, okay? Sounds like a plan. All right, so let's get started. So you were born to Croatian, tall Croatian parents. In Austria, you were born though, right? Yes, yeah, so I was born and raised in Vienna. So was it kind of destiny that you would, you would eventually start playing basketball? I mean, you grew to be 6'3", but... When you were young, how how long how young did you start playing, and kind of was it in your in your way? Um, it wasn't. It wasn't. So um, my parents are from former Yugoslavia, and my mom was asked to train with ankle weights, and she said no to that and to the time commitment. <laughs> um, but my dad did have an NBA ball, like the original Spalding leather ball from right. back in the day when he was visiting the U.S., and he would take <laughs> me to the park, and that's kind of how the interest started. And so he took me to basketball uh, practice when I was like nine. And so I had some of the basics, but I grew too fast and I wasn't able to participate for two half years in any sports, except for like biking on the wow. home trainer. Yeah. Um, Cause my, basically like your bone density doesn't catch up to like your growth. Right. Um, and so I didn't get back to playing until I was 15. Really? Yeah. Yes. So, so you were 15 before you really started like seriously playing basketball. Yeah. That's... So I, would say I did have some of the basics down. Um, some of the, you know, I knew what a layup was, but yeah really playing not until I was 15. How old were, were you when you kind of thought, hmm, I might be good at this basketball thing? Um, well, I was kind of lucky because people thought that for me. Um, I was really tall. So and I, like I said, I did have some of the basics. So I didn't come in and just didn't know what I was doing. 
and because I was one of the tallest girls on the court and I was still um, like I was kind of athletic kind of coordinated um, so my club my first club which was the Flying Foxes back in the day uh, pushed me and it, like my second year playing it put me in the first league team and had me train with former Olympians WNBA players so I really you know some people thought hey there's some talent and they pushed me to kind of have that practice yeah. Did you also go through the, the youth Austrian national team system there? Yes, I did. So I, my first year, I participated in this, like, it's called a, a five cities tournament. And it's, I think, Bratislava, Zaga, Vienna, and two other cities. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was like the start of it. Um, and then the second year, um, I went to the European championships with the under 18 team. Um, so, and I was lucky. I had a, a coach that really was focused on also developing us as players, not just the national team. So we had a lot of like defensive basics, a lot of um, post-play basics that he really uh, made sure we did over the summer. How how does a, a player from a small basketball country like like Austria and a women's player at that, how how did you go about going? I mean, you ended up going to Portland State University. How mm-hmm. did that come about? Were you recruited? How did that how did that come to play? Again, I was kind of lucky. <laughs> um, my friend had actually met um, Scott Alvarez. He just started this website. It's called scoutmygame.com. And it was one of the first places where players could do it for free. So they would create a profile and then the schools contact you. And that's how I got wow. in contact with, with a couple of schools. I'm um, a lot of junior colleges and Portland State um, coach reached out to me and thought it was a good fit for his program. Yeah. Did you have more than one school interested in you or did you have to choose? Um, no, so it was mostly junior colleges, and my parents didn't support that. And then I was talking to another D1 school, but the assistant coach that wanted me um, left, and I decided that Portland State would be the best fit for me. Yeah. And what was it like for you to, to leave home? I mean, you, let's say you just started playing basketball maybe three years before you ended up going away to college, right? So yeah. you didn't know how good you were, really. And and was it difficult for you to think about going overseas in that sense to America, to the wide open America and, and leave your family and, and go to school and play basketball there as well? Was it difficult? Um, I think it was a big step for sure. And obviously you're nervous. Um, you it's different. It's a different basketball game. It's a different like your workouts are very different than what you used to. Um, I think um, as Europeans, we're like, or and where I'm like, where we're from, we're raised pretty independently. So maybe for me, it wasn't such a shock to leave home um, mm-hmm. at that age, but it was definitely an adjustment for sure. And having to do everything yourself. Um, I did spend a year um, in college before I went to the States uh, at university in Vienna. So the adjustment to university wasn't as hard as it maybe would be if I wasn't there. And I was also lucky. Um, I was in bilingual schooling with my entire school system. So I, my English was already pretty solid um, and I didn't have to really work so hard on that. What was the one thing that maybe made you the most nervous before you went to Portland? I think I'm meeting the new team. I was back in the day, I was very socially awkward. Uh, so I had a lot of anxiety around meeting the new team for sure. Yeah. And just how I, I will adjust and fit in. Yeah. Okay. And as far as basketball is concerned, you had a really solid freshman year, pretty standout freshman year. Mm-hmm. Um, but it seems like then after that, your your role kind of changed. Can you talk about how how your college college years were? Um, yes. Yeah, so obviously, my first year I was a role player. I came in as a freshman. I was starting, um, and then my second year I was a starter at the beginning, and then um, I had a concussion, and at the end, kind of um, my role changed. Um, I think, you know, I saw the team needed. Um, I tried to do, you know, you try to fit, find your role. It's obviously not an easy adjustment, especially if you come in as a role player. Um, but I also think that college is the next level and there's uh, players that are more talented than you, better than you. There's a better fit with the system, um, what the coach is asking of you. And um, so I just made sure I always gave, you know, my very best in practice um, at the games and kind of, played those role minutes that I was given. I mean, of course, you and I have talked, so I know a little right. bit more, but um, was it ever, did it ever come to you to, to transfer? Um, so there was a brief moment, um, but uh, for me, the decision was to figure it out and stick it out um, because I've, 
I always do. I'm the person that kind of also looks for their sensibility within themselves. So um, I, my approach to it was like, if I do this better, if I work harder or smarter, then um, things will turn out. And I think they did turn out like we won a conference championship and I was part of the team that built that. Um, so I think those are really big milestones athletically. And it doesn't really matter what your role in the team is um, as long as, you know, as you fulfill that role to the best of your abilities. And I think a lot of players, especially when you're, I was also a role player in Europe. So coming into college and being a role player and then losing that role, it's an adjustment. It's a mindset change. Uh, but I also think it's something that, you know, most athletes go through at some point in their career. I commend you for, for sticking that out because especially right now in the college landscape with the transfer portal, um, players, I, I actually agree with the transfer portal. But I think it's given players an opportunity to just say, okay, this is not working for me. I'm out, you know? And um, so I really appreciate the fact that you stuck it out and and you grinded it out, even though it may, may have not been the, the most ideal situation, but you stuck it stuck it through. And I, I think that's a, that's a important lesson that a lot of people these days need to learn is sometimes you need to just stick it through. Um, I also think... What? Oh, sorry. No, I think um, you have to understand the difference between a toxic environment, a place where you're not learning and not improving as an athlete, or it just being hard. And that's something where you self-reflection comes in, um, being able to have mentors, uh, people you can talk to and kind of discuss that. Yeah, that's important too. I usually tell uh, young European players when I was coaching or even now when I talk to young European players that if they have a chance to go to the States to play college ball, no matter what level, if it's NAIA, D1, um, D2, D3, it doesn't matter. If they have a chance to go overseas, play in college, that they should do it. Not so much for the basketball side, but for the life experience. Just being able to live somewhere totally different than you're used to, um, a different environment, a different culture. And I think just to live in America is pretty cool when you're that young, going to college because you have a lot of freedom. Um, what would you say how it was for you off the court? I 100% agree. I think it's a great experience. Um, just a quick note on the athletic, like there's nowhere else in the world unless you're in a EuroLeague where you have those kind of training facilities that kind of staff around you. So I yeah. think just from that standpoint, it's an amazing experience for any athlete. So if you have it, um, do it. I think from a personal perspective, it's also you grow. Um, I learned a lot about um, different issues and I think my world perspective grew so first of all you get to meet new people um you get to make friends all over the world they have different uh, backgrounds um different things they've overcome but I also um like I, I say this to everyone but before I came to the United States I for example wasn't very aware of racism and systemic racism and somebody asked me how I was back in Austria I would say we don't really have it and, and that's ignorant like my 18 year old self you know I'm okay. embarrassed but the conversation I have today is very different and you and so I think it's very very important if you can to go abroad whenever like half a year a month a week and really immerse yourself in the culture um, and be willing to interact with the people. Yeah, I I, I totally agree. Um, was it a big adjustment? Now we're talking basketball wise. Was it a big adjustment for you coming from Austria to a totally different style of play in Portland your, your, for your career? How, how how big of a difference was it for you? And what was maybe your the main um, adjustment that you had to make in your game? I think the biggest difference is the intensity of play and the workouts. Um, and when they send you a summer package, make sure you do the summer package. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think the biggest adjustment of play was definitely... Um, the systems like we had many much more systems it was much more organized to play we also had a very fast play so we had a eight second shot clock that was the goal um just very fast a lot of running um and just being able to read the court at that level and being um you know a starter with other freshmen we had to just figure it out on the go also um yeah. so those were a lot of adjustments versus like a less maybe demanding system what what were like tell me about your first practice in, at Portland, like, were you totally like, oh, what did I get myself into? Um, I think at that point, I was very, very excited, enthusiastic to be there. But looking back, yes, <laughs> 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 what did I get myself into? Um, no, we just had a, um, yeah, we, we ran a lot. Let's just put it that way. 
So did you did you do your summer packages or were you lazy and not doing your summer packages? Your work packages? Um, I, I want to say I'm a 6'3 post player and I've run up with the guards. So I did do my summer packages. Okay. <laughs> um, what piece of advice would you have told yourself to your 18, 19 year old self before going to America, looking back on it? Not to take it so seriously. Um, yeah. I was definitely the one who, you know, when something wasn't going the way you wanted to go or, you know, you didn't have a, you have an off shooting night, I would be the one that went back to the gym and played extra hours and went for another run and um, didn't really focus on like the rehab. And it was very like, there was a lot of like, you know, tension or anxiety around it. Not so much like I'm working out because it's like so much fun, which it was, um, but just not to take it so seriously and focus more on like you're playing college ball, have fun. And inversely, after you finish your career at Portland State, what would you tell your 22-year-old self, kind of like, okay, I'm going back to Europe to play. What, would, what advice would you give yourself then? Well, actually, I was ready to quit when I was done with college. So I was ready to not play, and I didn't work out for six months. And what I would tell myself is that you're going to fall back in love with the game and keep working out. That's definitely what I would tell myself. Excellent. Uh, yourself. Yeah. Excellent. So when you when you were done um, at Portland State, you come back to Austria. You said you took mm -hmm. six months off. Was it clear to you that you would when you once you started to play again that you would stay in Austria, or were you where did you have any thoughts about playing somewhere else? So I was actually starting my degree in Switzerland um, in the fall, and I knew it was going to be very demanding. They had actually advised us not to take any jobs, um, et cetera, et cetera. So. I was approached by a Swiss coach um, who knew I was coming through. I don't even like the gr basketball grapevine. And he <laughs> told me, <laughs> I, I really, I have, I have never spoken to that coach before in my life. <laughs> so um, he asked me to play and that team was two and a half hours commute from school and that just wasn't going to happen. And then I kind of reached and I was like, you know, but maybe I still want to play. And like, maybe I, it's not out of, out of my system yet. And so I reached out to a coach closer to my uh, school and I asked them if they needed a post player. And did it did it go well in Switzerland? Yeah, um, so I had a very supportive coach. Um, he they gave me the time to get back in shape. Um, we were five internationals, and you know three can play in Switzerland. So two yeah. of us were not playing anyway. So I had the opportunity to just get back in shape. And then COVID hit. So right when I was starting to get back into playing and finding my role and my minutes on the team, um, COVID hit. So our season got cut short. And then my second year, I was playing behind a very credible post player. Um, she's on the Ukrainian national team. And she, and so, obviously, I was playing behind her. Um, but I would also say I played my role, and that was just the role I had was giving her a time off. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, Austria is not exactly the hotbed of, of women's basketball. It's actually kind of semi-pro. You've, you've told me yes. that before. Can you briefly explain to me? the the system in austria how it's how it is for women's basketball and why it's kind of like semi-pro so currently we have an amateur league um back when i played we had um it was like a first league just regular we just didn't have a lot of professionals there was students who kind of joined so they were allowed to play and they were considered maybe as the pros but not really paid and we had one team which was flying foxes who had played for uh for the first three years um who had those um wma players or college players that would bring in um over the season so two or three of them right and so on so now it's an amateur league so we don't have professionals um and it's a very like reduced playing so we all play each other twice and then the playoffs are basically semifinals and finals it's more of a yeah it's not we don't practice as much as you would practice in switzerland um it's more of a get back to playing or um like a hobby league in that sense yeah and so how many teams are in the league in the, in the league um, eight. Eight. Okay, so... And I hope I said that correctly. <laughs> the, the, the season is not terribly long, and the competition level is probably not the greatest, or especially someone who they played at college, uh, someone like you. Um, what is your what does your season look like? Like, explain to us how many times a week you practice, and for you, I, I know you, you like to practice, and you like to get in the gym, so what is, what is your week look like leading up to a game so because i was getting back into shape in my role i was working out probably 10 times a week um so two a days 
um, and then we would have a game on the weekend. Um, for most of the team, it was three team practices and maybe um, two two times weights. And then I was doing three weight sessions, um, one or two individual sessions. I would go for runs and I would do some agility work. Um, and most of that was was on your own, or were you giving uh, given a, a plan kind of from your coaching staff, or was that so I have. Your own thing? No, I have a plan. So I have an athletic trainer who does my weight, um, my weight plan and my athletic plan. And then I was working out with an individual coach for my individual stuff. And then, you know, if you get shots, if you have a shooting buddy or someone. So, yeah. And I mean, you, 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 you'd like to, to, to get in the gym and work. I said that before. Is it, is it frustrating a little bit that, that maybe women's basketball isn't so developed in Austria? I think, um, so I look at the girls now that play like that are 18, 17. I think the individual skill level is higher than what it was um, back when we played. So like, um, but I think um, sometimes the older players are missing to give some of like the team play guidance, you know, the defensive reads, the the offense flow, uh, and that's missing. So to have those people, you can look like the people I learned from the WMA players, even, but even just like people who now play outside and, um, that just over time reduces the quality of the league and the quality of overall play that comes out. Right. Um, so I think if the league was a little bit more attractive, also maybe stronger or older or more experienced Austrian players to stick around, then that would strengthen basketball in Austria too. And it would also help building a national team, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, speaking of former players and older, older players that kind of taught you a little bit the ropes, can you name a couple of those players that maybe, maybe gave you some pointers back in the day and, and kind of helped you out that were kind of like leg legends in, in Austrian women's basketball? Well, one, somebody who was, um, so from who I played with, uh, I think somebody who's a center um, name in Austria is Jana Lichnerhova. She played several years with Flying Foxes um, and she was kind of like my basketball mom. So she uh, taught me, showed me a lot of stuff, was very patient. And obviously they had to be patient because it was my second year playing when I played with them. So <laughs> let's, let's be <laughs> expectations, you know? Um, and then I played with uh, Lindsay Wisdom Hilton who told me a lot about, um, she taught, ta taught me a lot about playing her role um, because it was my second year we were playing Euro cup and she said something, uh, she, she just, I think she didn't make her baskets or something. And I just said, oh, it's okay. Like you played really well. And she was like, oh, I don't care about that. Like she had her 10 rebounds or whatever. And it was just the way she said it. And that was like, it's not what you, like if you make your points or whatever, it's about the role that you take in. And if that's defensive that night, if it's offensive at night, it's you still contribute to the team win. And that's, um, I, I learned that from her when I was like 15. So um, we also had, um, Eli Pavel, who was a center from Romania. She also played quite a while in um, Austria and across um, Europe. Um, and she was just physically very strong. So I got beat up playing her. <laughs> so I probably beat up other players now. Um, and then on the national team, Sophie Plank, um, Kata Takas, those are girls that really kind of showed you um, the mentality, like working really hard, expectations, um, you know, you knew who not to talk back in practice um, and so on, yeah. Um, I asked you that because there's one name that, that um, asked a, a question from my story, and mm -hmm. you probably know who, who she is. Um, her her name on Instagram is Miss Oracola. Sounds yes. familiar. Yes. Yes. So I've she actually asked, never played with her. <laughs> yeah, but she she's older. But yeah, um, she she asked, "Why do you like playing in Austria and not somewhere else?" So the reason for me to come back was twofold. Um, I was abroad for six years. I just finished my classes with my master's. And so it was the opportunity to come home and spend a year home. Um, and then the second was obviously, like I said, I wasn't really back into full shape. And in 20, I think 20, they announced there was going to be a women's national team again. And I was part of the national team system basically the entire time I was playing. And that was also one of the reasons that I was like, I really, this is an, like an athletic goal. Like being part of the national team is important to me. Um, and so I was thinking about my options, what would be best or the best place for me to develop. And here I had, like I said, the individual coach, I was able to work out with twice a week. Um, the national team athletic trainer is actually the athletic trainer for Chris Neuburg also. So I was able to work him with, with him really closely. 
and I decided that for me it was the best environment to um, get back into role playing and um, get up my minutes and also uh, get like work on my confidence in my game. Um, you spoke okay. You just actually I have to skip another question because you just said something that I, that I, I I also dealt with. How is it? You're playing for the Austrian national team, but your mm -hmm. your parents are Croatian. You probably consider yourself a Austrian Croatian woman, right? I would say I'm almost consider myself more Austrian. I'm not trying okay. to find my parents, but like okay. I said, I was born and raised here, and it was just um, yeah, we weren't really that big on our Croatian heritage or culture. It was very neutral. Is it is yeah. it weird? And this is this is when I played with the national team. This was a very surreal moment for me is it weird for you to put on your austrian jersey but you have croatian roots you know for me it was when i played with the austrian national team it was incredibly weird the first time i put on the jersey and the red and white jersey and um i heard the austrian national anthem and i'm standing there with a whole bunch of white guys um <laughs> and, and hearing a, another national anthem other than the American one, it was it was crazy for me. But that was the, that's what I chose, you know. It, did you ever ha feel any kind of like, hey, this is not the Croatian national anthem? I have to be honest, probably not your experience. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, because like I said, we grew up um, in Austria. We mostly just went to Croatia to see family, and um, for us, it was there was some ambivalence because there was not really the Austrian culture, not the Croatian. And like when there was a big football event, obviously we cheered for Croatia. But for me, there was never a question what national team jersey I would put on if it like came down to it, yeah. Um, so this is another question from Ms. Orokova, a, a little bit into, intertwined into mine. Um, in a short, relatively short time, you've amassed quite a collection of trophies. Um, you won three league titles, three cup titles, if I'm not mistaken. How do you keep your motivation high because you're winning almost every title that Austria has every year. Um, how, is it, how is it for you to keep your motivation up and not get bored? Good question. I was actually asked this by a younger player. Um, so for me, this year was an amazing team experience. Um, so that was just very special in and of itself. I think your motivation is that you want to be better than you were yesterday. Um, for me, like I said, the reason I go weight, like lift, or I know what is missing right now, and I know what I need to work on. And looking at, you know, playing somebody from Montenegro or playing somebody from Denmark, I don't want their center to push me out of the zone. Um, I don't want them to, you know, like they're big girls, you know, and I don't want to look like a little kid next to them. Um, so for me, just playing the best basketball I can play and improving continuously is motivation enough. Um, but I think this year was really about the team I was surrounded by and um, kind of making sure that we got that title um, because of how special that was that year. And having a perfect season obviously is a big deal no matter where you are. You know? Right. It, of course. I, I, I say it all the time. Um, it doesn't matter what league you're in. It doesn't matter what country you're in. To win a title is special and should not be not no matter where, because I mean you can be playing against Stevie Wonder School of the Blind, you still got to put up numbers, you still got to win, right? So, right. Um, spe speaking of numbers, I did have an, another uh, teammate question from Pac Man. Um, he asked me to ask you about if you feel like you're the Kevin Love of Austria because you've had multiple 2020, uh, 20 point, 20 rebound type games. In Austria, and if you feel like the Austrian Kevin Love, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I think when you look at my stats this season, you can see that you can see the work I've put in because they've improved yeah. over the over the season, um, and like the confidence and everything. But again, I really believe that uh, my coach and my team this year put me in that place, um, and. I've had the time and the opportunity to really work out at that level, um, which again, it's an amateur league. It's um, not everyone is working on a weight room like that, um, but it's, it's been feeling good to come back into that shape and like the playing, um, playing shape that I know I can be in. Yeah. 
um, what what are your plans like for the summer now? Like season is over. Um, what are you what are you doing before we go into what happens next season? So in two weeks we have the national team tra training camp coming up, and then I'm spending a month. Um, and we're playing Portugal actually in Austria. So if any, I think that might be open. I will let you know <laughs> um, if anybody wants to join. Um, and then I'm going to spend a month in Portland, um, and I have a like a workout. Um, so my trainer's there. I'm probably going to join my college team for open gym. So we'll see. It's going to be okay. Yeah. So that's how you're going to keep yourself in shape with the national team. Yes. And in the States, you know, while you're there. Yep. Okay. Um, let's, let's go a little bit off the court now. This is a, this is a weird kind of, kind of situation for women. Um, like women start thinking about the end of their careers relatively early con in, in comparison to, to men. Um, you guys have, you ladies have much more pressure you have much more outside influences that you that you think about um marriage starting a family career outside of basketball um so what are you 26 now mm -hmm. right um so now t technically as a, as a female athlete you're entering the prime of your career you're st starting to slowly enter the prime of your career um how much long do you see yourself playing um currently I would say at least another five years. Yeah. That that not depending on what country you're playing. Yes, currently at least another five years. We'll see. Go from there. Yeah. Um, do you do you have those kind of outside influences like maybe like your parents or your grandmother or somebody says, um, why don't you settle down and get a husband and, and get married and have some, some babies and stuff like that. Do you, as a woman, do you feel, do you feel those kind of outside pressures? Um, actually, no. Um, I recently single. So I think uh, currently that's not the topic of my parents' concern. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they, uh, no, my parents are very supportive. Um, they, see that I'm, I love playing. Um, I finished my degree, so, you know, I'm 26. It's up to me what I do next. Um, yeah. Um, do you think it's fair? Let's, let's face it. Guys don't have to face those kind of pressures. A guy can play till he's whatever, and nobody is saying, hey, why don't you settle down and get married and, and have a couple of kids and stuff like that. Um, how is it as a woman to, to, have those kind of influences do you think it's kind of unfair have you do you think it's unfair that that women are asked more uh to to do those types of things to end their career to do something that maybe they don't want to do because of outside influences um i don't know if i find that unfair um it is as a woman obviously like when you find a partner or when you reach a certain age like 33 you have to think about you know and you have a partner like do i want the baby now do i postpone it um i think those are difficult questions and if you the height of your career you know if you're playing your league do you really want to take the year off at 32 or do you want to risk not having a baby at 36 tough question and um, what i do think um is maybe a fair enough issue but then again it's hard because we often do have less viewership, you know, less interest and so on. But as a woman, you often have to make the choice to work while you play because you're not getting paid. Right. Um, and this is one thing about European basketball. I don't know if people are aware, um, but probably 90% of women that play European basketball don't do it for the money. Like they're not getting paid. They might get mm -hmm. a stipend to support the gas cost, but most of them work full time and then haul their butt to practice in the evening for four times a week and on the weekend and they get nothing but like I said a stipend of maybe 200 bucks or something and that's in any league except for like first league Italy France Turkey. Spain okay. yeah um they they do it for for the love of the game um I know someone who's really special to me she gets up at 6 30 in the morning so she can continue to play um so she finishes the job at like five um and I think that's if we talk about fairness, that's the unfair part because we put in the same amount of time, effort, um, yeah. and again, and if you know, if you were given the opportunity to practice at that level continuously, the game might also look more attractive to actually be watching. Right. Obviously, we can't dunk and so on, um, but that's that's I think that's the harder choice and one that your parents are often like, "Oh, you're not going to go for, you're not going to live off it," because compared mm -hmm. to like a salary making company, it's 
Um, I was lucky. My parents are very, I would say liberal. Um, and I was all of us very, you know, strong minded and kind of did my own thing. Um, so I never had those pressures, like you have to settle down. I'm sure there's uh, women though that hear it all the time. And it's another thing they have to face next to like already kind of justifying that they're still playing. Yeah. What do you think can, can change that process? I, I mean, I know that's a very multifaceted question, but <laughs> what do you think, um, what do you think is there, is there something that can maybe change it? Is it, should it be something from politics that helps um, women's sports should it be more just a, a, a society in general mind shift? Um, what do you think has to happen in order for it to be an even playing field for women? I think it is really hard. Um, and except for what we've now seen with the NCAA tournament numbers, it's hard because obviously the viewership for Austin women's basketball is a lot less than men's women's basketball. Let's just right. start there. But there is leagues. There is women's teams in Europe that fill gyms and then have the viewership. Um, it probably starts with like um, pushing basketball at like the lowest level and developing, like putting that money into developing players and making it attractive for them to be players um, to support their um, workouts, um, actually have competent trainers. Like, I mean, a lot of basketball coaches um, in, the, in under 18, under 19 are people that barely play basketball themselves. Right. They, they're just making it for a little bit extra cash. So maybe paying them, paying coaches sufficient money to only be coaching or at least not have to work a full-time job while they're coaching and have their own families. I mean, that's a good start to make it more attractive to get the quality of coaches into the system. Right. And then, um, yeah, I mean, it's a tough one. Like, you know, you can't force yeah. people to watch it, but I think it starts with your friends supporting women's basketball. Like if you see your friend working really hard, like come to their games, show up, um, right. support them, give them a shout out, make it more attractive, but it's, it's a hard one. I mean, okay, I, I know the, the Austrian basketball system very well on the men's side. And mm -hmm. of course, when I, from, from the, the difference between now and back then when I played is, is huge because uh, there's TV games now and things like that. And there, there was none of that back then. Um, so obviously, Austrian basketball has developed on the men's side, but it seems as if, if I look back to when I played there, the women's league, when I played there, was also pretty good or solid. And there were some really good players and, and we, we would also go to women's games. Um, and it's just crazy how it seems that the Austrian men's side has, has developed as far as salaries and um, viewership, TV, sponsorship, things like that. But the women's game has kind of dropped off a little bit to where it's actually amateurism. And I think that's really a shame um, that, that it is like that, but I also don't have the answers. Of course, I'm not living in Austria. I can't really say um, what, the, what the, the changes should be. But I think it also, what you, also what you spoke about, but I think also, especially in European countries and smaller European countries, I think there also has to be some more support from governments, local mm -hmm. and state governments to give women girls an opportunity to play if i think about my my daughter is 11 years old and it's a different world compared to what i can imagine it's like in austria as far as the training goes and and you know getting girls to play and things like that it's it's really kind of great out here um but it's for sure still not the same level as the german boys and you know side of basketball so um to make a long story short i, I think it just has to be a there's a combination of things, like you said, and, and it's, a, it's a really difficult subject, but I, I really wish um, me being a girl dad that as my daughter gets older, that these kind of um, these kind of imbalances between men and women's basketball, I hope it, I hope it changes. So that was my get on my soapbox and preach uh, for, for a couple of minutes. Let me get back to the questions before everybody tunes out. Um, also, outside of basketball, um, so... You earned your, you were Big Sky All Academics honors four times. You got your degree in international business and in, 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 in administration, if I'm not correct, if I'm correct. Uh, and you even did a, a year of law school in Vienna. So you're obviously a smart cookie. Um, what is your dream job? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know. 
um, so I think my my dream would be to coach and help people. Um, so I've gone through the process of being an athlete, of having to write my resume and being like, I've never done an internship. Um, so I think that's a tough one. And you, I went to a master's that is a pretty good degree um, school and looking around me and there's people from McKinsey or, you know, BCG interns and that maybe worked at Google before. And I had a little breakdown, like a identity crisis. And I was like, I haven't done anything. And I had a great career coach and she, you know, showed me, and on, the, on some level I knew, but you know, when you confront it, it was hard in that moment. Um, right. So um, I think just helping people tell a story. So you no know, helping athletes move on to the next level whenever they're ready. Um, so I think that would be a dream. Also uh, leadership and executive coaching, because I've been in all sorts of teams. I have had all sorts of um, leaders, so coaches, um with different characters and so i would say i do know one or two things about how that could be maybe managed more effectively um so long term i think that would be where i see myself um and what i would be enjoying doing um how important do you think it is to parlay your athletic ability and let what you've learned over these years like you said with coach different coaches different personalities um how 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 important is that to to parlay that into something away from basketball and to, to kind of give back um how important is it to you to me it's something i'm passionate about um so i um when I help people fix their resume or write the cover letter and help them really tell their story, uh, that is fun for me. I enjoy doing that. Um, I don't know if you have to give back um, per se, but I do think that the experience that you've had is something that is very unique. Right. And whether that is within a team that you work in where you can be the one that is not the most competitive, but it's the one that, you know, figures out how to work in a team or whether that is um, helping people deal with their boss or giving them, you know, different tools it's something that you can use as an asset and become a more valuable team member i don't think right. everyone has to want to give back because of their flat experience well i mean technically if you're if you're helping someone else you're giving back technically if you're you're the one that yeah. says okay um, i'm going to help you with your resume or i'm going to help you um transfer these 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 goals or these these um things that you have as an athlete you're giving mm -hmm. back so don't yeah. under undermine your what you do and what you're passionate about and say, oh, I don't know if it's given back because it is. Yeah. Well, to me, I would say to me, it's very important just because I went through it. Mm -hmm. um, and I see friends struggle like with, you know, how do I say this or why is my experience as valuable as someone else's? And I think as athletes, there's so many things like time management, commitments, so many things um, where you you have an advantage over a lot of people in the workplace. And I mean, it's, it's something you said earlier that like you had a breakdown and you're like, okay, I've never even done an internship. I think that's, that's something that, that a lot of athletes face. Like you're so driven by wanting to be the best. You want to uh, raise your game up. So you're out there practicing, you're doing a lot of things and um, kind of the normal life kind of passes you by in a, in a sense. But, I'm glad that there are people like you. There are other people that are that are career coaches as well that are are helping these athletes understand that they have these attributes that can transfer into the real world, and um, I think it's very important. One more question about about that: Is it when it when is it too early, or is there a, a too early for athletes to start thinking about what they do after they after they stop playing, whether it be football, ba basketball, baseball, it doesn't matter. I mean, I think unless you're like, you know, a EuroLeague, NFL, NBA type athlete, um, then maybe you have a lot of time. But I think for almost anyone else who's not at that level um, out of college, just it's not you don't have to think about it right away. Like, what does it want to do? But start thinking about what do I like doing? What interests me? What am I passionate about? Uh, maybe pick up a hobby that's not about performance or talk to people that you might be interested in. Just like have informational interviews, even in college. Um, it's good to start building that network and start having an idea. So you're not like when your career is over, when you get, you know, injured, knock on wood, you don't, but um, right. that you have an idea. It's not like confronting you in that moment. You're just like, Oh my God, what am I going to do? And then 
it's a whole like half a year here or you find yourself somewhere where you don't want to be i think it's something really important that you just mentioned that that um to actually go on interviews even if you're not really trying to get the job just to just to get that kind of experience of sitting in the in interview and, and being asked questions and, and figuring things out because let's face it not not everyone is going to use their degree, degree, especially athletes. I mean, how many athletes are there that that, that get their degree um, in one th field? They play 10, 15 years, and then they go into something totally different that has nothing to do with their with their uh, chosen degree. And I mean, it's 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 crazy if if you think about it that people, kind of uh, athletes in general, that that you can finish college and then play a, a career a long career and then they have no work experience and kind of like that what if uh, so i think i think it's probably like you said there's it's there's no time to to say it's too early to start thinking about what happens after my career but even if you're a euro player euro league player or or something like that it can be over like that right so i guess and one I tip mean, yeah go ahead no go ahead um, one tip, people are so willing to talk to you when you reach out on LinkedIn. If you tell them you're an athlete, you're considering this career, they're so willing to have informational interviews. Um, it's beyond me because um, you're a stranger, but people are really willing to help. Yeah, yeah. So one more um, of these type questions. What's next for you, Pia? What are you, what are you thinking about for in basketball terms? What's next? What do you think might be your next move? It's probably too early um, to say concrete yeah. something, but what are you thinking about? Well, um, after the season and looking at the national team, I'm um, definitely going to look at my options and then go from there. Oh, you're yeah. keeping your cards very close to your chest. Okay, <laughs> I thought I was gonna, I thought I was gonna get a scoop out of you or something like that, Pierre. Come on, I, come on, you're my, you're my, you know, I haven't, you're... I haven't talked to important people yet, so. It's, okay, I, it's I got be, you. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not gonna try to, to pull your teeth and stuff. Okay, so, um, so now I've got a couple other uh, lighter questions. Um, Compare your game to a WNBA or NBA player. Who is your game like? I wouldn't know how to answer that. <laughs> who, who, who would you, who, if, if you had to say, okay, my game is like LeBron, what's your game like? Who's, who is your game like? I, I, this is the worst thing I could say right now, but I do not follow the NBA or WNBA, and I could not tell you who I think my mm -hmm. game is. It's like, wow. yes. That, that is quite possibly the first time anyone has ever admitted that. Thank you, Pia. I, I commend you <laughs> for your honesty. <laughs> <laughs> and it's okay. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Okay, I'm going to just skip over that question right now. Um, who was your basketball inspiration growing up? Um, I... Loved watching Del Don. Um, I loved her oh. height and the way she can, uh, like how she, she plays like a forward and a guard um, at her height. Mm. I love the ease with which she like shoots the ball and with which she does a little um, pull up jumper and spin move. And so I really, really enjoyed watching her play. And she was, um, she was who I hoped I would be like when I um, would be ready to play pro see, or college. See, you, you could have compared your game to her. I don't think I can. <laughs> okay, okay, maybe the the bootleg version, but <laughs> nevertheless. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have any game day rituals, like superstitious rituals? I'm not superstitious, but I do like to have a certain type of lunch and a certain type of like pregame snack. And if I can, I have a nap and I have my pregame playlist. What's in your yeah. playlist? So um, my favorite songs to listen to are, uh, no, I'm going to, but I think that one is from Ray Black, No Pressure. Okay, yeah, it is. Yes, <laughs> because I always mix the two up. And then um, Drake Solid are probably my two go-tos. So. And are there's a couple other ones in there, but those are the ones I have to hear before a game. Okay, I got you. Yeah. Uh, me being a former coach, I'm in very interested in this next question. Mm -hmm. Have you ever made fun of one of your coaches behind his or her back during a practice? During a practice, or or like I I know that that 
uh, my former players they used to they used to kind of crack up if I was giving like a very heated halftime halftime speech, and I I, I could see them about to laugh a couple of times. So <laughs> so like I would like to like say I haven't, around. but I'm sure I haven't. So. I I am very glad that TikTok and all of that stuff wasn't going on when I was coaching because th that would have been a nightmare I think for me as a coach. Uh, to have my players dancing around before right. practice and stuff like that. That would have been a nightmare. Um, who's the best player you ever matched up against in your career? And did she just kill you? Um, yes, she killed me. Um, <laughs> and it was, uh, I forgot her name, uh, the Oregon Center. Uh, okay. Ogi, Ogi, uh, no. But the Oregon Center, uh, okay. like th three years ago, she killed me. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and 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 she killed you. Yeah, okay. had taller than me and a lot more athletic than me. I mean, you're six three. You got you got good size. I do not want to play an Oregon post. <laughs> <laughs> their their guards are six three. <laughs> what what game shoes were you wearing when you won the championship a couple of weeks ago? Uh, LeBron. I think the 17 lows. Okay. 16 or 17 low. Yeah. Okay. Last question. What do you miss the most about college? That's all about the sport. Like you can just go play, um, go have fun, uh, go to school and there's nothing else to worry about. So it's all in-house. It's You got no real worries. Yeah. Your, every, your classes are set up for practice. Yeah. You, know, yeah, you don't have to figure out what for... you're going to do for work someday. Yeah. Right. Just play yeah. go practice yeah. did, okay I said that was the last question but did you did you party a lot in in college did, you go, did it, you go to frat I did parties not. you did not I did not no I nice actually, time, good I actually yeah um, we were at in town school so our college parties were in very small houses and you could barely move around <laughs> and then we had a dry season, and if you got caught, you kicked off the team. So I was a little scared of that, and I was like, if I go drink, I'm going to be caught. That was my approach to it. Right. So I was pretty careful about it, yeah. Okay, I got you. So that's it. You hit the shot at the buzzer. Thank you very much, Peter, for coming on, and I appreciate you taking time out of your evening to hopefully inform some of my teammates and give them some much-needed information. Um, teammates, I'm going to give – uh, Pia's Instagram and, and other stuff in the description in the YouTube video. So please support her, follow her journey uh, with, the, with the Austrian national team and to whatever country team that she ends up playing next and beyond. So thank you again, Pia. You and I will be in touch anyway. And, um, yes. But I, I really appreciate you coming on and, and being honest and forthcoming, even though you don't watch WNBA and NBA. You're still my <laughs> You're still my IG homie. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. No problem. All right, get out of here. I'm going to say goodbye to your teammates. Bye. Bye. Um, so, everyone, thank you for, for joining us tonight. I hope uh, Pia was able to give some information that helped you. And as usual, if you found something interesting, please pass it on to someone else. If you if you know someone that, that might need this kind of information, please pass it on to someone else. I think we're at our best when we're sharing and helping the basketball community out and improving ourselves through others. Uh, yeah, that's it for tonight. I've got another show on Friday. Guest announcement will be coming up soon. I'm really excited. I'm really super excited for this one because it's a, a type of a type of person before I don't want to give away. It's a type of person that I have not had on the show until now. So I'm really interested to see my questions for this person and um, yeah, and how it, how it goes. I'm really excited for it. So that's it for me tonight. Hope you enjoyed it. Stay safe. Old head out. See you later.